Well, welcome back to our Bio 180 lecture series. So today we're actually going to be starting a new unit. We finished unit two, talking about biological molecules. And so now we're starting unit three, talking about different cell structures. And so it's just a map of where we're going. We're going to be starting out today talking about membranes, uh, because they're going to be necessary in a lot of different cell structures. So structure of membranes today and then we'll be moving on to the different organelles that you might find in a eukaryotic cell. And we'll have spent, spend two days on looking at those different organelles. And then we'll talk about some different organisms and their structures, including prokaryotic cells. And then finally, we'll conclude this unit with viruses. This is actually the shortest unit in the class. Uh, and a lot of people have had some experience with the different parts of the cell. Uh, but we'll try and go a little bit deeper than what you might be used to. As we look at today, so here's today's topic. We are going to look at how a membrane is built, what are some of the different components, including lipids, proteins, and carbohydrates. We're also then going to talk about membrane fluidity, some ex classical experiments that were run to illustrate that membranes were in fact fluid, some of the different factors in fluidity, and then we'll talk about cholesterol as a fluidity buffer. So let's go ahead and get started. And the primary component of membranes is going to be phospholipids. And so we can draw a phospholipid. So when you look at a phospholipid, it's often drawn as a circle, and we covered this when we talked about lipids. So the circle represents the polar head group. And then we have two fatty acid nonpolar tails. And so this region then is hydrophobic, it repels water, it tries to get away from water. But this region uh, often has a phosphate on it, has a charge on it, and so this is actually very hydrophilic. And so you've got this hydrophilic head and hydrophobic tails. And we'll use those words a lot. Now, one of the interesting things that happens is when you take a collection, if I were to just take a handful, of phospholipids and throw it into a beaker of water, they would spontaneously start to form either a, what's called a micelle or a membrane because these hydrophobic regions don't want to be next to water and so they will tend to get pushed by water altogether. And then the hydrophilic heads, which do want to be associated with water, water likes them, and so they'll orient toward the water while pushing these hydrophobic tails away from water. And so one of the ways when you get a lot of phospholipids together, the most common arrangement then where the tails are able to associate together and stay away from water is what we call a lipid bilayer. And again, these lipid bilayers just spontaneously form because this arrangement keeps all the hydrophobic tails together. The water would be on the top and the bottom associating with the polar heads, which are kind of protecting those hydrophobic tails from the water. And so you'll get this lipid bilayer, and that's going to be the beginnings of our membrane. So we'll draw a couple more phospholipids in there. A couple other pieces of terminology that you'll hear when we start talking about membranes. So together, this is a bilayer, bi meaning two, so that makes sense, there's two layers. Sometimes we want to talk about just one layer, and so that would be called a monolayer, or it might also be called a leaflet, okay? And it turns out, even though in this illustration it looks like both of these leaflets or monolayers are identical to each other, the, the same, that's not actually accurate. So bilayers, cell membranes, 
are what we call asymmetric. And what that means is that the two layers, so this side of the phospholipid bilayer, or this leaflet, will not be identical in its composition to this side. Now, one of the ways that they vary, so how do, do, do the two leaflets uh, vary? One of those ways is in phospholipid composition. Composition. And this is what we mean by that. The phospholipids themselves, we've kind of just said, okay, there's phospholipids, and it just seems like there's one type of phospholipid. That's not actually accurate. Phospholipids will have different polar heads on them. Usually the tails, there's some variation in the tails, but the real difference comes in the polar head groups. I'm going to represent the different types. There's four main types of phospholipids. We're not going to go into really what they're named. Just know that there's some different types. Two of those tend to aggregate on one side of the membrane. And then the other two tend to collect on the other side of the membrane. So we've got, we'll just say for this example, we've got purple phospholipids and red phospholipids. They're going to be in one leaflet or tend to segregate in one leaflet. And then blue and green phospholipids will segregate in the other. So the two monolayers are not identical to each other. They are asymmetric. There's an interesting thing that happens, and this does become significant. The cell has to maintain, maintain this phospholipid composition, actually. We'll learn a little bit later as we talk about fluidity that these phospholipids one thing that they do, they do it rarely, but sometimes you'll get a blue phospholipid that will cross over the track, so to speak, and get in the wrong neighborhood. And when a blue phospholipid ends up here, that can actually signal, particularly if this is on the outside of the cell, having the wrong phospholipids in that monolayer can actually signal that the cell is misfunctioning or malfunctioning. And the immune system, if it doesn't maintain or correct that phospholipid composition, the immune system will come along, recognize that, and actually terminate that cell for not maintaining its membrane composition. Seems kind of harsh, right? You're like, geez, I was getting around to it. No, you're dead. Um, but that's what's going to happen. And so it's really important for the cell to maintain its membrane composition. And again, these red ones will flip down to the lower side. Blue ones will flip up to the uh, upper side and vice versa. It does this slowly. We'll talk about that in a second. But it does do it consistently. So how does the cell maintain this separation or this asymmetry? And it does so because there are some uh, proteins. We'll talk about membrane proteins more in a second. But there's a basically a protein that will flow through the membrane and check kind of like a, uh, a membrane police squad, I guess, and it goes through and it makes sure that the phospholipids are on the right side of the membrane. Uh, and if they're not on the right side, then it will take them. So if we had a blue one that accidentally flipped up to this side of the membrane, then it would take this one and it would flip it back down to its own side. It would grab it and say, nope, come back down here. Interestingly enough, the name of that enzyme that moves it from the outside to the inside of the cell is uh, very creatively named flippase. And so that's what it does. It flips the phospholipids from one side to the other. There is also an enzyme that will place the inner membrane or the inner leaflet and take the blues and or take any reds or purples that come here and flip them back to the outside. And uh, the name of that one is actually called floppase. We talk about the movement being flip-flopping. And so you've got flippase, and then you've got floppase on the other side. And those two proteins will travel through the membrane and help maintain that phospholipid asymmetry. Another way that we're going to maintain, or that the two sides are different, we'll come to this in a second, is going to be through 
protein orientation. And so I'm going to put that down for right now. But the proteins that we're going to embed in the membrane and their orientation will be to the outside or the inside of the membrane, and that varies. And so as you were to walk along this surface of the outside of the membrane, it would look very different than if you were to work, walk on this surface of the membrane. Okay? Uh, let's continue. So far we've been going to call it this a top monolayer, the bottom monolayer, inside, outside. Let's take a moment and look at that. When we have an actual cell, So I'm going to draw a cell. And so this would be one leaflet. And this red leaflet, kind of it's going along with the red dots that I put there, is going to be called the extracellular leaflet. And so that would be the outer, the outermost leaflet of the cell is called the extracellular leaflet. Extra means outside. Uh, and leaflet means leaflet. Okay, and so then next to that, you would have the blue monolayer. So the blue and red together are making up a membrane, or a single membrane, single bilayer. And then this blue layer is referred to as the cytosolic. leaflet. Okay. The reason it's called the cytosolic leaflet is that the space inside the cell is referred to as the cytosol or the cytoplasm. And so this is just designating that that's the leaflet that faces or surfaces that space of the cytosol. In addition, you are going to have organelles inside the cell. We're not going to draw all the organelles. But the orientation of them is all the same. So this then is an organelle. This outer leaflet right here of the organelle, so this is the outside of the organelle, is still referred to as the cytosolic leaflet. And I drew it in blue because it would have the same membrane composition as our blue layer here. So the cytosolic leaflet, whether it's on the plasma membrane, is what this outer membrane is called, or the organelle membrane, the leaflet that faces the cytosol has the same composition and is called the cytosolic leaflet. Okay? The second leaflet is actually inside the organelle. Notice it has the same color as the extracellular leaflet and therefore would have the same designation. It would have the red and the purple phospholipids uh, in its composition. And so really the inside of the organelles, the inside leaflet of the organelles is the same composition as the outside of the cell. Okay, That seems a little bit weird for students when they first get started. But that's what's happening. And so this one, what do we call this? We can't really call it the extracellular leaflet, even though it's the same composition, because it's nowhere near the outside of the cell. So this one is referred to as the luminal leaflet. And the reason for that is this space inside that organelle is referred to as the lumen of the organelle. And so this is the luminal leaflet that faces it. We're going to see later in the course that you can actually exchange membrane between the organelles and the outside. And when they do that, what will happen is they'll form little bubbles or vesicles like that. That bubble or that bud will break off. You'll have a red inside, and then a cytosolic leaflet. And then those will eventually, this vesicle will come up and touch against this plasma membrane on the outside of the cell. And when it does so, the blue monolayers touch first, 
And then you can see then that opens up and then the red monolayers will touch. And so then the red becomes the red, so you can see how the inner uh, leaflet actually will flow and become the outer leaflet of the plasma membrane through this ves vesicle trafficking is what it's called. And so that's why the red is on the inside and the outside, and then the blue is on the cytosolic side in all cases. Okay? So it just has to do with the way that the cells operate. So that's a little bit about membrane asymmetry. Coming back to the phospholipids here that we're looking at. So we, we would have this phospholipid bilayer. It would carry on along here. One of the things, the phospholipid bilayer has been described as what we call a fluid mosaic pattern. Mosaic because it's composed of different phospholipids, different proteins, so it looks like a mosaic of tiles. Fluid, and it's been described as a two-dimensional fluid, meaning that it bends, it moves, it's dynamic, it's not rigid. And that's critical to its function. The fact that the membranes are fluid and can bend and move allows our bodies, allows living organisms to bend and move. If, if I had a hard shell, or if my membrane were rigid, then I would be like a tree. In fact, trees do have a rigid uh, cell wall that keeps them from moving. All I have is membranes, and they're fluid, so I can do stuff like that and move. And that's because the lipid bilayer surrounding each of my cells are themselves flexible and fluid. So what types of movements are allowed and what types of movements are not allowed in membranes? The following are allowed. So allowed movements. When you have a phospholipid, one of the things that it can do, so I'll, because it can do this, I'll write this in green. That's a good go positive color. They can do what's called a lateral movement or side to side action. So they'll actually exchange places. So anywhere in this plane of the membrane, they can move around. So we have lateral slash side to side. And they do that often and quite frequently. Another movement that people aren't as aware of, and I'll draw this with a kind of a spinny circle here, is that the phospholipids can do rotational movement. Rotational slash, we'd often refer to this as spinning. So they can kind of spin on their heads like a ballerina does, and they'll do so very quickly. And somewhere, um, it's in like the thousands of rotations per minute. I mean, they're actually spinning really quite quickly when they go through. So we've got lateral side to side, rotational. Then we have this category of rare movements. I'd like to say that they're not allowed, but they actually do happen. They're just rare. And that is called, so we'll put those in red. We already mentioned this earlier. It's called transversal movement. So they can't transverse the membrane. Or more commonly, we call it flip-flop. So the movement that's rare is this, a phospholipid from this monolayer flipping to the other side or to the other monolayer. And the reason why that's rare is remember you have this region right here that is hydrophobic. So you have this hydrophobic core in the membrane caused by the tails. And in order for this phospholipid to flip to the other side, that polar head, which has a charge on it, has to pass through that hydrophobic region. Well, that's energetically unfavorable. Remember, hydrophilic things don't like to go through hydrophobic spaces. Okay, So it's going to tend not to. Every once in a while, one of these guys will get enough energy, and it's moving around and bouncing around, 
enough that it loses control of itself and it does actually cross that hydrophobic barrier. And that's again when flippase or floppase will come through, identify it and rescue it and give it a pathway back into the cell. So they can do this, it's rare. What does rare mean for a phospholipid? An individual phospholipid will flip about once a month, okay? Now you might say, well, man, that seems kind of common if it's flipping once a month. Remember that they're doing side interactions like this, they're traveling side to side on the order of hundreds of times per second. So once a month, when you compare that to moving hundreds of times a second, is actually pretty rare, okay? So this would be, if you were to do it on a human time scale, this would like being going to Europe once in your lifetime, okay? It's not that common, it might happen, you'd have flop A's to bring you back, and you'd be good, okay? So that's kind of what happens, and those are the natural phospholipid movements that occur. Now, that's the phospholipid component in some of the movements. Another really important element that we have in the bilayer is going to be proteins. So now let's talk about our protein components. So now I'm going to draw the, the membrane a little bit differently. I'm not going to draw all those phospholipids. I'm just going to draw a green line across the board. We'll draw two green lines. And so this is going to represent my bilayer. So I'd have phospholipids right here, phospholipids right here, and I'm just not gonna draw them all the way down. So this is my bilayer. And embedded in that bilayer, we are going to have a series of proteins. So, I'm just going to draw some proteins. I'm going to draw them in kind of a ribbon diagram. So that would be a beta sheet. We learned that in our last unit. This, of course, this structure right here, this one's significant. That is, if you remember from our discussion of proteins, that is an alpha helix, secondary structure. And really, that's how, when a, when a protein has to cross through the membrane, the most common structure it uses is this alpha helix. And what happens is you have this coil, the side chains of the amino acid are kind of poking out from the sides of this alpha helix coil. And all of the side chains right here are one of those 10 hydrophobic amino acid side chains that we learned about. And so that's what allows it to embed in that membrane is this region of that alpha helix is all hydrophobic. So it feels super comfortable inside the interior of that membrane. And in fact, that's one of the things that keeps it anchored in that membrane. If I try and grab this part of the protein and pull it down, well, it takes all of those hydrophobic amino acids and pushes them into the water. Well, they don't like that, and so they plug themselves right. If I were to release that, they would plug themselves right back into that hydrophobic core. So, Again, just to reiterate, we often cross or transverse that membrane using an alpha helix field with hydrophobic side chains, and we see that quite commonly. We'll just uh, draw maybe another pro, so that's one protein. We might see other proteins, here's maybe another structure. Sometimes we'll have a protein that will, this one would transverse at one time. You might have proteins that go across the membrane three times. Uh, seven times is very common. Seven, uh, we call them transmembrane domains. Seven's common, 12 is common. Uh, and so you can have multiple. Here might be another example. 
This is a slightly different motif. Again, here's another protein. Now this one is a little bit different in that it's got an alpha helix, it's embedded in the membrane, but it's not transversing across the membrane. It's coming in one side and then coming out the same side. And so uh, this is just a different variation of a membrane protein. You can also have a membrane protein like this. Let me explain a little bit what's happening. In this case, this is actually a phospholipid or a modified lipid. And it's serving as an anchor. So the protein itself is right here, and then it attaches itself to this lipid that's embedded in the membrane. And so it's anchored. This would be called a lipid anchored membrane protein because it's anchored by some kind of lipid. It's not embedded directly into the membrane. Uh, now, there are two types of membrane proteins. All of the proteins that I've drawn in purple up here represent integral membrane proteins. So there's two types of membrane proteins. One of them is integral membrane proteins. Okay, so integral, integral membrane proteins are defined because they integrate into the membrane. And what that means is that they have some kind of hydrophobic region that embeds them in the membrane. So notice that all of these that I've drawn up here have something, they're, they're embedded in the membrane by some kind of hydrophobic region, okay? And that's an integral membrane protein. So um, there's a couple of subcategories of integral membrane proteins, so let's write them down. One subcategory is exemplified by these two. These two proteins are what we call transmembrane proteins. And what we mean by trans is that they go from one side of the membrane to the other. So they transverse it or they go across it. It's not hard. It means exactly what it says. A transmembrane protein. So these are trans-integral membrane proteins. Now, if you look at this one, this is an integral membrane protein. It's embedded in the bilayer, but it is not a transmembrane protein. Okay? So it doesn't go across. It's just integral. And then up here... So subcategories or special types are transmembrane and then lipid anchored. Membrane proteins. Okay, so again, lipid anchors are a type. Now, what determines whether a protein is an integral membrane protein or what's the opposite? The opposite is called a peripheral membrane protein. Okay? So peripheral membrane proteins are ones that are going to associate, so they're going to use weak bonding like hydrogen, so they're in the aqueous solution right here. They are hanging onto the membrane. They're associated with the membrane. They're a membrane protein, but they associate with the membrane by interacting with the integral membrane proteins. 
Usually this is gonna be through ionic or hydrogen bonding, right? Because those are the bonds that work in water solution. So this protein is gonna hydrogen bond or ionic bond with this integral membrane protein. So that if I were to lift on the membrane, I'd pull up the purple, because it's obviously integrated in the membrane, but I'd also pull up the red one because it's hanging on to the purple one. And so I would harvest both types of membrane protein with that. One other thing we might want to put that it's integrated into the membrane. So these integral membrane proteins are integrated into it. So what kind of weak bond is holding it here into the hydrophobic core? Well, these are being held to the membrane by van der Waals interactions. That's what works under hydrophobic conditions, right? So these ones are being held by van der Waals. Okay, individually weak, collectively strong, and so we see that there's a bunch of them in there on that alpha helix. Peripheral membrane proteins then are associating with integral membrane proteins. And they're doing so largely by hydrogen and ionic bonding between those. So you could have we'll put another, this would be a peripheral protein. You could have them on the outside. So you could have one like this. That would be a peripheral protein. Sometimes you'll have a really long structural protein like collagen or something. So some kind of fibrous protein on the outside of the cell or on the inside of the cell. All of these ones would be peripheral. The red ones are peripheral. Again, they are associating by binding to the integral membrane proteins. One of the key definitions, if you go back historically, how do you distinguish between an integral membrane protein or a peripheral, where those names come from? Actually comes to the original experiments when scientists would isolate the membrane. So they would take a cell, they would stick that cell in the blender and carve up all the pieces and parts to figure out what they were. And then they would take that, uh, that uh, lysate is what it's called and they would put it in a machine called a centrifuge that spins it around really fast under high gravitational forces. And you get a separation. The lipid membrane is less dense and anything connected to the lipid bilayer will settle at one place. It doesn't go into solution and then all the other proteins go in solution. And you separate those and take that membrane fraction. And then they said, well, what kind of proteins are there? And there were two things you could do to wash proteins out of that membrane. One is if you washed it with detergent, so we'll put up here, if you washed it with detergent, sensitive to detergent, if you used a detergent, then the detergent will get in there and it would break up the van der Waals interactions holding the protein to the lipid bilayer and you'd wash off proteins. And so if it washed off with a detergent, then it was an integral membrane protein. Before they'd wash it with detergent, though, they'd do a little bit more mild wash. So you can just wash it with a high salt solution. So high salts would have a lot of ions in it, and they would affect the charges that would, these ionic and hydrogen, it will compete with these charges. So if you wash a membrane preparation with a high salt solution, you'll interfere with these bonds that hold peripherals and you'll wash off the peripherals. And so that was the first thing they do. They wash it with a high salt and the peripheral proteins would come off. And then they'd wash it with a strong detergent and they'd get the remaining integral proteins off. They were harder to get off. And so that was the original designation of how you'd get an integral or peripheral. Peripherals were in the membrane component, but could be washed off with high salt because they were only being held by ionic and hydrogen. Van der, the integral membrane proteins being held by van der Waals embedded in the membrane, you had to use a detergent to get those off. Okay?
So that's the protein component. One more component that we want to talk about and leads to a different type of membrane protein. Attached to the surface of certain proteins, you will find these highly branched trees or components. We learned about these when we talked about carbohydrates, but you find examples of oligosaccharides. So remember, oligosaccharides are those short chains of carbohydrates. They're anywhere from three to 40 residues long, highly branched, highly diverse in their monosaccharide composition. And so you would find these sort of trees of carbohydrates called oligosaccharides. Proteins that have oligosaccharides attached to them are called glycoproteins. So let's write glycoproteins up here. And glycoproteins equals a protein plus an oligosaccharide. And that glyco, glyco refers to sweet or sugar or carbohydrate. So really the name tells you this is a combination or a mishmash between a carbohydrate and a protein. And in fact it is. Specifically the carbohydrate is an oligosaccharide. So anything glycoprotein, you could have, it doesn't matter, these are examples of integral glycoproteins, but you could also have sugars attached to a peripheral protein. So you could have a peripheral glycoprotein as well. Okay, so that's glycoproteins. You could also have, we didn't mention it earlier, but sometimes you can have a lipid. So here's a lipid. And then you could have a lipid attached to a oligosaccharide. And when you have a lipid attached to an oligosaccharide, you might be able to guess what we call that. If you said that is called a glycolipid, then you would be correct. So glycolipid is a lipid, really it's a phospholipid, plus an oligosaccharide. So that should give you uh, quite a bit of vocabulary when we're talking about membrane components. We have oligosaccharides that we've defined. We've defined glycoproteins and glycolipids. We've seen that we can break down the different proteins in the membrane into different categories, integral or peripheral. We learned a little bit on the basis for that. So that, if we come back over here, we've talked about membrane components. We've talked about the lipid components the protein components and give you some vocabulary. And we've talked about the carbohydrate components. So let's continue to talk then about the proteins. Do the proteins move also? And there are those that thought that the proteins did. Actually, when they were originally coming up with the theory of membrane, some people thought that the proteins, they knew proteins were a component of the membrane. But some of them, uh, in a model that was proposed, a model that's known as the sandwich model. And they said the membrane itself was a phospholipid bilayer, and then the proteins were kind of static and sandwiched that bilayer, kind of like a, a membrane cheeseburger. And so this was called the sandwich model. And so you have proteins on the outside. We'll put sandwich model. Okay, you have proteins on the outside in each case, and then the bilayer in the middle, and that's how they thought the proteins were arranged. This obviously turned out to be wrong and moved toward our fluid mosaic model that I just mentioned in which you have the membrane and then the proteins are actually embedded in the membrane. So now we have proteins but are embedded or integrated into the membrane. So do these proteins, and even to some extent, they're originally, we know they move now, but how did they find out? How did they know that the phospholipids moved? 
There are a couple of key experiments that I want to describe to you that helped us understand the mobility or the fluidity of the membrane. So we'll put this under key experiments. One of those key experiments was called FRAP. And FRAP stands for photo bleaching, or fluorescent, sorry, fluorescent recovery after photo bleaching. Right. So the experiment goes something like this. They would take either a protein, or you could actually do this with phospholipids. And so here's a phospholipid. And the researchers would chemically attach a fluorescent dye onto that phospholipid. That would then make the, and then they'd put it back into the cell. And so you would have a cell. And when you would look at it under the microscope, it would have all these fluorescent dyes, and it would glow whatever the color of the dye was, like red. Okay. Now, one key on this is that the connector, the chemical linker that held the dye to the phospholipid, if you were to shine a high-powered laser light on it, so this is laser light hitting that, it would cleave that bond and the dye would fall off. And so that's what we call photo bleaching. We're hitting it with a laser light wave, a pho photon, photo, and then it bleaches it or removes the dye or the color from it. Everyone understands? So that's how they set the experiment up. And so what they do is they would first create a cell that was colored, and then they would aim a tight laser on one spot, and they would bleach it. And so you'd have this spot of white in a sea of fluorescent color. And they reason that if the phospholipids, or whatever they labeled, either phospholipids or proteins, could move in the membrane, then this spot should disappear after a while because the, the individual other components that did have dye would move into this bleached area, and so you would recover the fluorescence. That makes sense? And so that was the experiment. They set it up, they photo bleached, and lo and behold, as they waited and watched, the color did return. So you did recover the bleach spot. This indicated that whatever they labeled was moving. If they labeled phospholipids, not only could they tell that they were moving, so they knew the phospholipids were moving, but you could actually, depending on the surface area, the size of that spot that they bleached, and how long it took to recover and become red again, you could tell how fast they were moving. And remember earlier I reported that they move on the order of, of uh, many reiterations per second. So they could actually start to get rates of how fast the phospholipids we're moving inside the cell using this experiment, which I think is pretty cool. So FRAP was a key experiment in, a, in confirming, one, the fluid mosaic model, and that you had these allowed movements. You could do the same thing, and you could put an inner leaflet so that, that it doesn't move. Imagine doing the same experiment, but you only put the dye on inner leaflet phospholipids. So the cell actually doesn't. You can get it to work in there. You might have to design the experiment a little bit more carefully than what I'm saying. But if it then, if it flips, then you can photo bleach it or affect it somehow and measure whether you can recover it that way. And so that doesn't work as well because there's not as much transversal movement that's allowed. So you can do a lot of different things with the FRAP experiment. The next experiment that they did, or another one that they did, was called a hybridoma experiment. So in the hybridoma experiment, we're going to take a human cell and a 
somebody to sell, like a mouse cell. And then they labeled these. So they again took a fluorescent label. And the trick on this one was they took the human cell and they would develop a marker for the certain protein. And we're going to say that this one was a red marker. So they added a red dye. And so this cell looked red. And then they took the mouse cell and they added a green dye to it. And then it turns out that if you take two cells and you put them together, you can, and you hit them with a strong electric shock, you can fuse them together. And so they would create This hybridoma is what it's called, a hybrid cell. Half of it would be human membrane with the human proteins marked here on the outside, and the other half would have the green membranes. And they start divided into two spheres or two halves. And so if the proteins move, then over time you should see the green move into the red area and the red move into the green area. And eventually, you just have this mix that underneath the microscope, red and green actually create yellow under the microscope. So eventually, if they move, you'd expect to see a yellow cell. On the other hand, if they don't move, you come back an hour later, you'd expect to see red on half and green on the other half. And so when they came back after one hour, they found that the two different colors had intermixed throughout the cell. And so then they could reason that that protein label, those proteins that were embedded in the membrane, were in fact moving in the membrane. And that's how they proved it. As you do, it turns out on, on additional studies, they found out that most membrane proteins are mobile in the membrane. There are a few that are anchored. So there are some where they did this and it did stay red and green because those particular proteins were anchored in the membrane somewhere. They were being held in a particular position. But the majority of proteins are fluid. So move lateral. Proteins will also rotate or spin. Proteins, we said phospholipids will sometimes flip-flop. Proteins never flip-flop. They're too big to move, so they never flip-flop. So that is a little bit about some of the experiments um, that prove membrane fluidity or that gave us our picture of membrane fluidity. Now, let's erase this last experiment. And, uh, Come back and ask the question. So we know that membranes are fluid. Do all membranes have the same fluidity, or are they equally fluid? So factors of fluidity. And the answer to that is no. Not all membranes have the same fluidity although the fluidity of the membrane is important for function. So let's talk about a little bit about that for a second. Can you have a membrane that's too fluid? Well, fluidity in a membrane is determined a lot by the phospholipids and their movement and their association with each other. And so, the same thing that affect, we talked a little bit about fluidity of lipids before when we talked about fats and we talked about phospholipids, and they somewhat obey the same rules. So the membrane is supposed to stick to each other. The phospholipids are supposed to stick to each other, so you have a barrier to keep things in and out of the cell, but they also have to be fluid so that we can move. And so there's this balance. If we get too fluid, then the membrane will either not, will disintegrate, will fall apart, or the other thing that happens is it starts to lose its integrity, and so we'll get things going in and out of the membrane that shouldn't. It becomes too porous or holy, I guess you'd say. It has holes in it. So yes, you can become too fluid, 
and that results in increased porosity of things coming in and out and decreased integrity. How about what's the opposite of fluidity? In the lipid world, we call it viscosity. So can you be too viscous? And the answer to that is yes, you can be too viscous. So too fluid is a problem, but you can also be too viscous. And that means that you have decreased mobility. And that's the primary concern. You also have um, it becomes less flexible to, um, and more prone to breaking or shattering. If it gets too viscous. Remember that the membrane proteins that are embedded in the membrane are designed to move. They have to, receptors have to move around the membrane to contact other receptors. Uh, there's a lot of signaling that goes on. So these proteins are actually, in most cases, not only can they move, but they actually have to move in order to carry out their function. And so if the membrane come, becomes too viscous, it can slow down some of that function, and they will no longer work very well. So you have to be able to maintain this perfect kind of sweet spot of fluidity in the cell membrane. So what influences or what are the factors of fluidity? They're the same factors that influence uh, lipid fluidity uh, that you might see in, say, butter. Uh, those factors are going to be temperature, OK? So as you heat a membrane up, it becomes more fluid because it's breaking those van der Waals interactions. Heat increases fluidity. Okay. Another factor is tail length. Remember how fluid or how viscous the membrane is has totally to do with how well two phospholipids stick together. The phospholipids stick together along those long hydrophobic tails. And so remember, they're making van der Waals interactions. And so the longer the tail is, the more van der Waals interactions you can make and the more solid they're held together. So longer tails will form more viscous membranes. Shorter tails will form uh, more fluid membranes. Now, start to look at this in conjunction with temperature. So if you have a cell membrane that's in a really warm environment, would you want to have short tails on your phospholipids, or would you want to have long tails? Well, the heat is going to tend to make it more fluid. So to combat that, you might want to have longer, more stitched together tails so that your membrane doesn't fall apart. All right, so you can use this to combat that. You usually can't, well, actually we do as humans, you might say, do we change our tail length? We don't, we control our temperature. So we keep ourselves at 37 degrees Celsius. But things like plants and bacteria, they don't regulate their temperature, so they have to use some of these different strategies. We talked about this previously with lipids, but saturation. So tail length longer decreases fluidity. Saturation is the idea of saturated versus unsaturated. Another key word in here is double bonds, particularly cis double bonds that introduce those kinks into the tail. So when we have a double bond, this would be a saturated chain. It's long and straight. When we have an unsaturated, so we put a double bond in that tail somewhere, it causes this kink in it. 
So now I can form Van der Waals interactions up here. I can form Van der Waals interactions down here, but there's these spaces where the distance is too far apart to form Van der Waals interactions. So when you have a bunch of kinks in your phospholipids, they don't stitch together as tightly and they'll be more loose. So in this case, saturation, meaning that there's no double bonds, saturated equals no double bonds. And that is, tends to be less fluid. When you introduce double bonds, equals one or more, and that is more fluid. Okay, so we've got temperature affecting fluidity, we've got the tail length affecting fluidity, we've got the saturation affecting fluidity. This is in plants and bacteria, they will actually change their phospholipid content in the cell and add more or less saturation in order to fluctuate with changes in temperature or changes in the season. That's how they kind of keep their membranes fluid enough to carry out their cell functions. Animals control their temperature, but we also use another factor that I'm going to call the cholesterol effect. And so I'm going to come back over here to explain the cholesterol effect. And to understand the cholesterol effect, you have to remember the structure of cholesterol. Cholesterol. So remember, cholesterol is notable for these four fused rings, and then it's got a little tail here. But the key to this is going to be its four fused rings. And so in a membrane, I'm going to try and draw this to scale as much as I can. Okay, so that's more or less the, the scale of the four fused rings. You got these four fused rings and then this tail, and that equals close to about where it would sit in the membrane. Now, here's what happens. Cholesterol is going to work as kind of a phospho or a fluidity buffer in the phospholipid bilayer. So let's consider two extremes, their effect on fluidity and how Cholesterol might mitigate, based on its structure, those extremes. Let's consider first uh, heat. So let's say hot temperatures. When it's hot, that's going to tend to break down those van der Waals interactions holding the membrane together and essentially melt out the membrane. So the condition is we're going to have uh, two, uh, two fluid. And what's really happening in there is that the phospholipids um, are moving. The heat causes increased movement in them. And so when they're in the membrane, they start moving around. The temperature makes them wind around. Normally, they're kind of circling like this. But then with higher temperature, they really start wigging out. And so now these two phospholipids end up pushing apart because no one wants to go be around someone doing this. Right? And so the membrane starts to kind of expand a little bit because the phospholipids are all wigging out. Okay? And they can't make van der Waals interactions anymore. How does cholesterol influence this? Cholesterol 
has a very stable ring structure. And so what happens is cholesterol in the membrane, it's heating up, but remember it can't wig out because it's, it's fused in this ring, these four rings. So at most when cholesterol heats up, it can kind of wiggle like this. But it can't really wig out like the phospholipids around it. So up here on this higher end of the phospholipid membrane, it's got this stable ring structure that's coming along, and as the phospholipid is wigging out, those rings bind with the upper part of that tail, and they seal it. And so it's still trying to wig out, but you can start to pack them closer together, and so it improves the viscosity and their ability to come together and bind by sort of pegging down the tops of those phospholipids and keeping under control the excessive movement caused by the heat. So cholesterol will take a warm membrane and tend to cause it to become more viscous, okay? Or keep it from becoming too fluid, it might be a better way of saying that, okay? So, great, we understand that. How about the other condition where it gets too cold? So now they're packed together, it's too viscous, and What's happening now is the phospholipids, remember it's cold, so instead of wigging out, just the opposite. The phospholipids are now just kind of shivering right here. And now they can get together and there's not much movement to keep them from making a lot of stitches along their chain and really coming together tightly and that's what's causing the membrane to become too viscous. How does cholesterol help with that? Well, cholesterol, Notice that those ring structures are actually not only stable, but they're also bulky and they are kinked. So you've got this big ring right here and then it goes over and big ring right there and then this tail down here. So it's got several kinks built into it and they're big and they're bulky. And so they can kind of come in and they're associating with the phospholipids, but they're keeping apart. They're trying to huddle together and come together, and that ring structure comes in and keeps them apart. And the best way I can uh, sort of, I used to go to a lot of uh, church dances when I was younger, and so if the couples got too close, there would always be someone that would come along and like put a book in between you or you know, separate. That's like what cholesterol is doing. It's big bulky structure is coming in there and separating those phospholipids from coming too close together, okay? So a different feature same structure, but a different property of that structure helps to buffer and keep those phospholipids apart and maintain it at more fluid when it wants to just come together and be viscous. And so cholesterol, because of this four, unique four fused ring structure, is able to stabilize a warm membrane or a melting membrane, and it's able to separate and uh, and maintain fluidity in a cold membrane. And so that's how cholesterol is working at both extremes to maintain fluidity. So humans, or mammals in general, use this strategy. We're maintaining our core temperatures at 37 degrees to control our fluidity. And we also use a lot of cholesterol. So we will kind of set the thermostat. There's different cell types that need different fluidities. And so we'll control that at the same temperature by regulating the amount of cholesterol in a certain membrane. And so we can fine tune how fluid or how viscous an individual membrane is by how much cholesterol is inside that membrane. So cholesterol is actually essential to the human diet. We can't go without. People are like, don't eat any cholesterol. And you don't have to because you actually synthesize cholesterol, but you do need cholesterol. It's an essential nutrient. Uh, because you have to maintain the fluidity and the set point of your membrane fluidity. So now we can come back and we have talked about membrane fluidity. We've talked about a couple of experiments, FRAP and Hybridoma, that allowed us to identify and confirm that membranes were fluid. We've talked about the different factors of fluidity like heat and chain length and uh, saturation. And then we've talked about how cholesterol acts as an important buffer uh, 
for fluidity and maintaining the fluidity of a particular membrane. That will end our discussion today on membranes. We'll come back and see you next time as we talk about some of the organelles that are inside the cell.